All right, so we are going to be talking about this tonight, technology and the mark of the beast from Revelation chapter 13. However, we need a little bit of a news update, don't we? Okay, so let's get that. Interesting things, pro-gay church plans to build worship space brewery, donate profits to Planned Parenthood. So this is the world that we live in. I need not say more. We're going to see a lot of interesting things tonight, just so you know. A whole lot of interesting things. And you look at that, you go, well, have you, remember what um, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote for the last days uh, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, having a form of uh, chapter 5. Maybe, I don't know, 1 Timothy 5, whatever it is. In the last days, perilous times will come, that passage. Um, they will be lovers themselves, haters of God, and so forth. Uh, in there it says, having a, the people will have a form of godliness, but denying the power, denying the truth. So that would fit that. Pure genocide, over 6,000 Nigerian Christians are slaughtered, mostly women and children. So there are more people being martyred for Christ than in any time in history. Did you know that? Right now, in Africa is being decimated. Um, uh, other parts of the world, less so, but still uh, more than ever in the history of the world. In the book of Revelation, we see the souls of those who had been slain for their faith. And, and um, the question is asked, how much longer, O Lord? Till you avenge our blood, and the Lord says, just a little bit longer, um, and it's coming. But we're, we're watching this great increase. So we, we know about the increase of the last day signs. If you follow the Olivet Discourse, or if you understand Bible prophecy, Olivet Discourse, the words of Jesus, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, signs of the last days, that they would be like pregnancy pains, increasing the frequency and intensity. Apparently martyrdom is part of that. Uh, people losing their life because they are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. In America, we can still freely worship. I do think that door is about ready to shut. But in many parts of the world, you're being killed if you're a follower for Christ, of Christ. And so it's just, th these things are real. Uh, but we still have a window that's open. I don't know how much longer. There's this. Missouri Republican who said Hitler was right wins state house primary. So there you go. So people say, no, that's only the Democrats. Well, there you go. Um, and, and so anti-Semitism is increasing. In fact, two weeks ago we filmed a documentary. Uh, I was the host and I interviewed Olivier Melnick. And Olivier Melnick is very well known. Uh, he's a saved French Jew. Remember, he was here just recently. And so we filmed the documentary and um, in that... It's about anti-Semitism, uh, 2,000 years of anti-Semitism, and then where we are today and where this is going in the future. We know from the Bible this is only going to increase, and it's going to come from the left, it's going to come from the right, it's going to come from both sides. We are watching it. Uh, Florida, then you have this, battling dual ecological disasters. What aren't they telling residents about the connection between the toxic green algae and red tides. What aren't they telling us about anything? California has fires, worst fire his, uh, year uh, so far. Uh, we're, we, we're wars and rumors of wars, everything. It just keeps going down this, th th these paths, but there's a lot more to come. Um, how tech's riches plan to save themselves after the apocalypse. Now listen to this. Uh, this author writes, he said, last year I got invited to a super deluxe private resort to deliver a keynote speech what, to what I assumed would be a hundred or so investment bankers, the rich people. After I arrived, I was ushered into what I thought was the green room, but instead of being wired with a microphone or taken to a stage, I just sat there at a plain round table as my audience was brought to me. Five super wealthy men, all men, from the upper echelon of the hedge fund world. After a bit of small talk, I realized they had no interest in the information they had prepared about the future of technology. Uh, they had come with questions of their own. Some of the questions, so these are some of the richest people in the world. I don't know who was at the meeting. You know, you can, mind, can start to wonder, who are these rich people? Which region will be less affected by the coming climate crisis? New Zealand or Alaska? 
The questions continued like that, and then finally the CEO of a brokerage house explained that he had nearly completed building his own underground, underground bunker system and asked, how do I maintain authority over my security force after the event? The event. Interesting question. The event was their euphemism for the environmental collapse, social unrest, nuclear explosion, uh, unstoppable virus, or Mr. Robot hack that takes everything down. Uh, what I found most interesting about this is these are men who don't believe in God, don't have an interest in God, but they're looking at everything that's going on in the world, not from a biblical standpoint, but from a completely secular business mindset and looking and going, an event is coming and it's going to be bad. So bad, as I read more about this, they're concerned that even some of the wealthiest people in the world are realizing my money may not help. Isn't that fascinating? I find it really fascinating, again, because this isn't coming from a Bible preacher. This is simply coming from those who are in the world, who are in the know, who are super smart and super rich, watching. Very interesting. Then there's this. This is the last thing, then we're going to get into the message, and I'm going to tell you, the message is going to be shocking to, to a lot of people. But needly, uh, be factual, I'm not going to make up anything. So here we have the president of Iran, the president of uh, Russia, right? And Turkey, the three amigos. Um, remember that movie? Yeah. <laughs> it was a great, what a great movie. <laughs> At least I think it was. I guess it was Ray G. I better not talk to him in church. Uh, anyways, uh, um, so these are the three main players from Ezekiel 38 who form an alliance just on the other side of the northern border of Israel, on the other side of the mountains of Israel, and there's a hook that is in the jaws of this alliance that many have speculated will be an economic hook because Russia is going to be in a real bind and connected to energy. You have this major energy crisis going on as, as uh, I as uh, Israel now has massive energy fields, huge energy fields, able to supply Europe with energy, which will cut out Russia, which puts Russia in a really precarious spot because Russia is the main supplier of gas to uh, Europe. So, you guys following me? Okay. So Israel starts doing that, cuts out Russia. What's more intriguing than that part is right now these three, their economies, as we are here right at this moment, are absolutely in a free fall. They're completely collapsing. I don't know when the Ezekiel 38-39 war is going to take place. I'm not going to predict the date on that. But I look at that, and as I look at the free fall of the economy, this is what appears to me. That hook has been set. And we're going to watch this thing. I don't know when the rapture is going to take place. I don't know when that war is going to take place. But man, it is the most, it's the most interesting thing. It's like these chess pieces are being moved on the board, and this is like a checkmate for the Ezekiel 38 war. I'm watching this going, this, where is all this going to go? Well, we know where it's going to go, but how is it going to get there? We're starting to see, and when will, will happen, we have no idea. I, at least I have no idea. Maybe some of you, I'm sure some people are blogging right now, they know when. But um, I don't know when. But it is fascinating, folks, because these three ne in the history of the world never got along, these three countries. And now they're, they're, they have an alliance, and now all of their, co their economies, because of some things Trump has done, have absolutely caused them to be in a, in a free fall. We live in a fascinating days. So this is where we're going to go right now, and this is going to become more fascinating as we get into this message. Uh, technology and the mark of the beast, and hold on to your seats. Yes, let me pray. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, very good, because none of them were going to remind me. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity. We pray for your blessings on our time together. To you be the glory in Jesus' name. So here we are. We're going to talk about technology and the mark of the beast, Revelation chapter 13. Before that, as I've been reminded, here's the deal. I'm going to ask you to pray. Uh, next Sunday evening, we're supposed to have a guest here. 
Uh, it was confirmed a while back, but I like to get things reconfirmed like before you get there. So I, I, I can't tell you who, but uh, we have a guest that's supposed to be here next week, uh, an Israeli guest from the, uh, the IDF. He was a former commander, and I want to talk about a lot of things that are going on in Israel right now. So he's supposed to be here, but trying to get a hold of somebody in Israel is not always all that easy. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to please pray, because there's things that you all need to be updated on. I've been watching the Gaza War and so forth. Uh, next Sunday night, we're also going to change the worship up a little bit. We're going towards the Messianic flair. And then I have a couple of other opportunities that are coming just for Sunday nights, um, which I... This is my sound. I still can't tell you who they are, too. Uh, um, some things are confirmed, but I've got to wait till we get closer. Uh, exciting things are happening. Um, we have a lot of opportunities to really reach out and partner with some Israelis, and it's pretty cool uh, to see what, what God is doing. But with that, pray for next Sunday night, please, and uh, let's get going. So here we are, technology and the mark of the beast. Uh, where is all this going? So if you have paid attention to the news over this past week, you saw this, that evangelist Greg Laurie, uh, he has a Harvest Crusade coming up in Anaheim, California, uh, beginning next Friday. By the way, we will be here Sunday, just telling you, Sunday night we'll be here. Uh, but next Friday, he begins his Harvest Crusade in Anaheim. He has this billboard up in Orange County, California, had, and he's holding in his hand what, uh, a book. Now, uh, it doesn't say the Bible on it. Talked about it this morning. Many of you saw this on the news already. It made nationwide news. Uh, the Irvine Company made him take down uh, the poster because it had the Bible, even though it doesn't say Bible. So he argued, well, it doesn't even say Bible on it. How do you know it's not a book? Take it down. They redid the artwork so there's no book in his hand, and they still wouldn't let him put it up. So because the Bible is too offensive, and it, 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 it doesn't go along with the politically correct direction that this world has entered. So that's part of the problem. Then there's this. You've been watching the Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all these things are going on. Uh, this is an article from a couple weeks ago that I read. A uh, Twitter censorship problem looks like it's here to stay. Uh, Twitter sparked backlash after suppressing Republican congressmen as part of an algorithm change that cracks down on bad faith actors. Other conservatives have faced censorship and suppression as well. Twitter has stepped up its speech policing and recently acquired a smite which fights hate speech and trolling online. So basically, anything that doesn't agree with the current PC narrative. Got that? Bible doesn't agree. PC narrative. Shut it down. At the center of the company's censorship problem is its decision to penalize bad faith actors. In other words, you're not going along with the PC culture, uh, bad faith actors who aren't actually in violation of any rules but still threaten healthy conversation. In other words, you hurt my feelings, therefore you can't be here. That, uh, so think of that. Now here's this. A liberal professor warns censorship of InfoWars will backfire on the left. So if you're following the news over this past week, InfoWars with Ac uh, Alex Jones was shut down on Monday, I believe it was. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, just pretty much across the board. Uh, Twitter hasn't shut him down yet, but and whether or not you know Alex Jones, whether or not you agree with him or disagree with him, is not really even the point at this point. The problem is uh, it, it was, he was shut down. The, the, the uh, Infowars was shut down. Um, professor Eric Nielsen, again a liberal professor, warns in a New York Times op-ed that the kind of censorship that saw Infowars banned from most major social media platforms will eventually backfire on the left, he writes. Uh, in an article entitled, If We Silence Hate Speech, Will We Silence Resistance? Now, this is their language, right? Uh, but, but listen to this. Nielsen, who is an associate professor of liberal arts at the University of Richmond, writes that mounting pressure from the political left to censor hateful speech may have unintended consequences, cautioning... Uh, the left, that leftists should be wary of applauding the likes of Apple, Facebook, and YouTube banning Alex Jones, Nielsen writes. If we become overzealous in our efforts to limit so-called hate speech, we run the risk of setting a trap for the very people we're trying to defend, or we run the risk of setting a trap 
for ourselves. I can guarantee you this is the direction this is going. Uh, the dam has been broken on free speech. Uh, we've had free speech in this country for quite some time. Praise the Lord. But uh, I know biblically the direction this is going. So we have, it's coming, all right? So it, it, you, uh, Alex Jones is a big target. He's an easy target. Uh, conspiracy theorists and, and the rest. Very well known out there in the world. So, uh, but Candace Owens, not as well known, conservative, African American, uh, was, uh, was shut down. Then by accident she was shut down, put back on. Uh, so this type of thing, it keeps happening. Oh, it was an accident. Oh, it was an accident. Oh, we didn't mean to. These are, I believe, test grounds to see how it goes. But Alex Jones was shut down. Uh, uh, folks, I'm just saying it's very concerning because if they go after one person, what's going to stop them from going after anybody else? Whether or not you agree with somebody. That's, you know, there, there's a bigger problem here. Whether or not, just because you don't agree with somebody, does that mean that they should be in jail? You know, well, I don't agree with you. Hurt my feelings. This is the world that we live in. This is what Revelation chapter 13 speaks to. And uh, so we're going to see how the Bible says this is going to play out. Some of the things are going to surprise you. You ready? To see how far along we are on this. Um, in Revelation chapter 13, this section, we're going to be introduced to term the beast, which we've already seen before with the Antichrist and the false prophet, um, and also uh, the mark. Uh, so the mark is something that will identify each individual who receives it within a uh, global database. Uh, so with the mark and the mark of the beast, uh, Revelation chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 19, and 20 carry references to the Antichrist in association with his mark. Uh, in God's eyes, the mark is hideously vile. It's a sign of mankind's ultimate rejection of him and descent into evil. In Revelation chapter 14, for example... And we'll come back to all of these things, just an introduction to where we're going. Uh, in Revelation chapter 14, for example, the Bible says, The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So to receive the mark of the beast is a complete rejection of God. I give my authority to the Antichrist, I submit to the Antichrist, and therefore I worship the Antichrist. So God says, hey, you receive the mark of the beast, you're done. You have no chance at salvation. That's a remarkable statement. And it's a scary and a frightening thing. So I'm going to answer seven questions, and I think you're going to get a really good understanding of some things tonight. So you ready? Okay, number one, what is the mark of the beast? Well, Revelation chapter 13 Beginning in verse 16, says, He causes all. That'd be the false prophet. And again, we've already looked at the Antichrist. We've already looked at the false prophet. So this is the final message in Revelation 13. He, the false prophet, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Note a few things about this that we can just tell from the passage that we just read. Um, this mark has to be an identifier because that's what mark in this context means. It may or may not be visible to the human eye. It will make the person visible to a global database. Uh, we'll get to the databases in a few more minutes, but, but I want you to think on this. Uh, see this picture up here? You see, I don't know if you can read what's behind him. It says, Facial Identification Section, Real-Time Crime Center. Um, now, this is artwork, right? But this is what is really happening. In China, they already have this facial recognition system that's up. Uh, people are judged based on a social credit score. And we've talked about the social credit score over in China before. Um, but as we think of this facial recognition, the mark must be on your right hand or on your forehead. So when you think of facial recognition, 
uh, our face is already being scanned. In a lot of places in the world, that's already happening. Um, we've heard about RFID chips and, and that type of thing happening. People having a chip in their hand. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to answer this because I'm going to forget to deal with it later. I get asked all the time uh, if, if I receive some type of chip for medical purposes. Have I received the mark of the beast? Okay, here's the, No, you're correct, sir. No, you have not received the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast does not come into effect until the midpoint of the tribulation, at the point that we just read. When a person makes a conscious decision to worship the Antichrist. When you went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you really should have this medical chip, it'll help in case you have a medical emergency, did you say, yes, I submit and I worship the Antichrist? No, you, you didn't, right? You just took it. Right now, it's a smart thing to do. And if you're thinking, well, that's going to be used against me, I got news for you. What, they, uh, what is already stored in you about the databases we'll get to in a few more minutes is way beyond the medical. The medical information is already stored in a database anyways. Now it's just they can just read it and, and fix you, all right? So now it's not such a bad thing. Well, fluffy, if you got a dog, you probably got chipped, right? Your cat's probably chipped. Right now, it is not the worship of the Antichrist. But the technology of the Antichrist is here. Uh, now check this out. So this article says, Democrat Senator Infowars, hence uh, Alex Jones, who I just mentioned, cut off last week. Right? Infowars is just the tip of a giant iceberg. Um, this Democratic congressman is quite excited about this. Because what he sees is we can go after everybody that doesn't go along with our plan. Uh, anybody who doesn't agree with us, anybody who challenges us, now we can go after them. The dam's been broken. We've shut down InfoWars. Now we, it's been private industry. The government hasn't done it. So it's been private industry, Facebook, YouTube, so forth, right? Not the government yet. But uh, this is the direction things are going, to get policies in place to shut down the dissenting voice. Okay, you guys still following me? Truth is treason. This is from the Russian Times. An empire of lies. Listen to this. Ron Paul, remember Ron Paul? On big tech censorship. After the executive director of the Ron Paul Institute got suspended on Twitter, the former congressman from Texas told Russian Times that social media crackdowns are part of a broader effort to silence dissent in the United States. So this is following Infowars. This is following going after Candace Owens. This is just shutting down anybody that's not politically correct going along with the narrative of Revelation 13. While social media could be a real delight and very informative, the biggest role social networks are playing is working with the government, Ron Paul uh, said on, on Tuesday. The government is indirectly regulating speech through companies like Twitter and Facebook, he added. This is a quote from him. You get accused of treasonous activity and treasonous speech because in an empire of lies, the truth is treason. This is what George Orwell warned of in his work 1984, when, when uh, you speak truth and it becomes a punishable offense. So we're watching this. Not with the government yet, but right now we are watching it with private industry. And you have the senator saying this is the direction things need to go. Continuing with the quote, Challenging the status quo is what they can't stand, and it unnerves them, so they have to silence people. Wow. Folks, I'm telling you, this is the direction the dam has been breached. Number two, what is the big deal? At the time of Revelation 13, nobody will be able to buy or sell unless they receive this mark. Uh, as such, only those who receive the mark will have access to food, to uh, clothes, to housing, transportation, or anything else involving a uh, monetary transaction. But receiving the mark, as we've already seen, is to your own eternal peril. That entire context of Revelation chapter 14 uh, tells us this, beginning in verse 9, the, the, the text I showed you a few minutes ago. Then a third angel followed them, with, saying with a loud voice, there were 
There's the 144,000 Jews, which we're going to look at in two weeks. Um, then after the 144,000 Jews, there's two angels. So this is the, the 144,000 Jews that tell people about the gospel of the Lord, right? The 144,000 Jews, one angel, and then a second angel, now a third angel, followed them all, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. This is pretty clear, isn't it? You're in the tribulation period. You receive the mark of the beast. It's over for you. Forever. There's no possibility of turning back. Wow, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Now, I want you to think with me through this. Uh, you say no to Christ now. The rapture takes place. You go into the tribulation period. You're somewhere in the halfway part of the tribulation period where everyone must receive the mark of the beast to buy or sell. You're a nice person. You didn't receive Jesus, but you're still a nice person. You have a little child, a son or a daughter. And the doctor comes to you and says, we have good news. We have good news and bad. Bad news is your, your daughter has uh, cancer, but, but the good news is there's a cure. And your daughter can be cured with one, just one dose. That's it. And this is great. And you think, this is wonderful. Then the doctor says, it's going to cost you $100. What are you going to do? You have a problem. You want to save your daughter, Right? Your heart, you're looking at your daughter who's going to die. The only way you can save your daughter's physical life is to buy her this dose, but to do that, you have to receive the mark of the beast. You have to submit to the worship of the Antichrist. What will you do? That's a problem. This scenario will play out over and over and over again during the tribulation period. As people look, I love them, I can't let them die, I must, and they will submit to the mark of the beast. Um, the people saved during the tribulation, who get saved, who come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not receive the mark of the beast, will do so under great stress, under great trial and enormous and painful obstacles. So before we move further, I'm just going to throw this out there. Consider this. If you can't say yes to Jesus now, when it's easy, what makes you think that you can say yes to Jesus at that time when you have situations like that? I'm going to tell you the best solution is to receive Christ now. Number three, how is it possible to have such complete control over commerce? Can't buy or sell, right? So think about it. The technology necessary to fully regulate buying and selling uh, until just a few years ago wasn't, it, it was kind of there, but not really. Uh, and, and the thought that no one may buy or sell unless they receive uh, the mark or, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, until fairly recent, that seemed figurative. In fact, I can, there, there's articles I've read from just a couple of years ago that say, ah, this is just figurative. You and I now know, or 2018, it's not figurative. We, we can tell, no, this is real. Today we can know it's, it's literal, it's factual, and it's coming soon to each and every home. Um, you can't hide. Uh, think of this. It, it, go back in your mind. I remember when I first became a Christian, there were some cheesy movies that were made. I remember some of those in, in about, uh, I think some were from the 70s. I didn't get saved until the late 80s. But there are some pretty cheesy movies out there. After the rapture takes place, what's going to happen? And people are running. you got this underground network, right? 
and everybody's going to get saved, and, you know, and they were exciting, and, you know, and, and, but they're running from this kind of stuff. Uh, the reality of it is you're not going to be able to run like that. Technology has eliminated that possibility. We now know it's going to be virtually uh, impossible. You, if you own a home, you will lose your home even if you don't own a mor- owe a mortgage on it. The reason why, you aren't going to be able to pay for electricity without buying or selling. You aren't going to be able to pay your taxes. Uh, you're going to be gone. So you start playing just some of these things out. You're not going to be able to buy gas for your car. Uh, in, in an attempt to hide in places like basements, um, like in the days of the Holocaust, that's going to be I- impossible. Uh, there's now drones that can track you and technology to find people that are in the most remote places. And all cash is going to be gone. So all trade is going to take place uh, electronically. And when we look at this from 2018, it does not seem symbolic. I mean, look at this and we go, well, we are here. I can tell you right now, I love going places and not using cash. Some of you, that might bother you. I love not using cash. I love going places with my phone and paying with my phone. Uh, some people are probably thinking, well, that's like the mark of the beast. No, it's not. Because right now it's convenient. You know what else is convenient for me? Uh, we have this app on our phone and we can track our kids. That's pretty cool, right? All these things are convenient now and nice this side of the rapture. In the tribulation period, it's not going to be just mom and dad tracking. I'm sure it's not just mom and dad tracking now. But you look at things, you think, okay, I I can see all these things. As a matter of fact, nobody will be able to buy or sell. To assure this will happen, a world government that controls all commerce, from the smallest transaction to the largest, will need a communications grid. It will need everyone to be connected, and trillions of dollars are now being spent on this to build such a grid. Uh, it's already being done with the most remarkable device of our time. Uh, it's being done with our smartphones. Now consider this, an iPhone, from, an iPhone 4 from 2010. That's like an ancient iPhone, isn't it? 2010 is like 100 years ago. Uh, an iPhone 4 from 2010 is more powerful than a Cray 2 supercomputer, the fastest computer in the world in 1990. That's, your, that's an old phone. That's an old phone. You got a flip phone? It's probably like that. <laughs> so I know some of you do, because I see them thinking, you guys actually got those things? <laughs> hey, they can still track you, just, just so you know. <laughs> remember phones that used to have this cord attached to it? It had a dial? Anybody old enough to remember those? <laughs> remember eight-track tapes? <laughs> now I'm really getting out there. Um, Here's something else. When men first went to the moon in 1969, the onboard computer NASA sent with them was an engineering marvel, but a late model smartphone is 43,000 times faster. That's just your phone. I don't know about your flip phone, but you know, other phones. Uh, Your smartphone has up to 2 million times more memory. That's pretty wild. The Apollo computer was 70 pounds. (laughs) Your smartphone uh, fits in your pocket. Uh, in, in fact, your, your modern smartphone not only beats what went to space in 1969, you have more computing power in your pocket than all of NASA's computers around the world combined Combined when men first walked on the moon. Okay, now this is going to really get interesting. Let's step up the ante, all right? Number four, who will build the, the infrastructure necessary for the Mark to work. Uh, it'd be better yet, who has been building it? Uh, most of it so far has been built by private enterprise. I mean, there is so much money. Apple is now a trillion dollar company. You start looking at these things, but some of these things are also subsidized by the government. You think, why does a trillionaire need to be subsidized by the government, right? Nevertheless, this is the world we live in. But give you an example, Hillary Clinton had promised Broadband internet service for everyone in the United States by 2020. Uh, uh, There are similar proposals in almost every country. In third world countries, free phones are given to almost everybody. 
They're just giving out. Now, why do you think that is? Because people in charge just want to be nice? Well, they won't give them any food, but they give them a phone. They want everybody to be connected. I mean, doesn't that seem a little bit suspicious? Why would it be that way, that everyone's getting phones? Okay. We have space technology, we have phone technology, and we have databases, and we have, there, there's, there's technology um, that has reached that point. I'm going to read this to you. It's really fascinating, uh, so listen carefully. This is an article written by a writer that I like to follow. Uh, his name's Matt Ward. His article is titled, The Technological Tipping Point from July of 2018. He write, wrote, it's no overstatement to say that we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that is going to change our world forever. This transformation is happening now, and we will see significant change occur, not over the next couple of decades, but within the next couple of years. Very few people in today's busy world are aware of just how much their lives are about to change and how unavoidable and irrevocable this change is going to be. The technological innovations described herein are widely believed to be those that will occur in only the next five years, mostly by 2022, within four years. By the end of this year, 2018, it's estimated that up to 90% of all people in Western countries will have truly unlimited and free mass data storage. Woohoo! right? Uh, this means more data than ever is now being created and your data will be kept in perpetuity. By 2021, three years, the first robotic pharmacist will arrive in the U.S. AI, artificial intelligence, and robotics will soon begin routinely taking over huge swaths of Western domestic job markets, leaving mass unemployment as a byproduct, which is going to present an economic problem. In the short term, robotics and AI are going to decimate all service-oriented industries. If, I'm not sure if you've heard uh, about this. If you follow the news real closely, not, I'm, I'm not talking just your local news and entertainment news that comes from America, but there's a universal wage, an attempt to go to universal wage where pretty much everybody makes the same amount of money except for the people at the top. Right? Well, the, one of the reasons they're getting to that is because they see artificial intelligence and robotics taking over everything, and we've got to make sure everybody still has money. It's fascinating. But artificial intelligence is no longer limited to just the assembly lines. Very soon, it's highly likely that all types of telemarketers, bookkeeping clerks, compensation and benefit managers, receptionists, couriers of all types, proofreaders, computer support assistants, marketing research analysts, salesmen and saleswomen, uh, and drivers of all descriptions are going to lose their jobs to automation augmented by AI. You already hear about trucks, delivery trucks, that are artificial intelligence, right? No driverless. You hear, we're hearing about these things. Not that they're having great success with them, but the, the test is there. A workplace revolution is coming that none of us can escape from. It is even widely believed that AI may replace qualified teachers in the coming decade or shortly thereafter. We are all going to be affected by the emergence of AI. Now I'm thinking uh, teachers is exactly what they'd like to go after because then you don't have any dissenting voices in the classroom teaching the kids. Everything would be absolutely controlled. By t this it gets really fascinating. By 2022, it's estimated that one trillion sensors from all across the globe will be connected to the internet. The world really is getting smaller and smaller, and our place to hide in it has almost disappeared. From the clothes that we all wear, even down to the ground that we walk on, it is all going to be connected to the internet and soon. This means that people will have every single facet of their lives monitored, recorded, and endlessly analyzed remotely. By 2022, it's estimated that fully 10% of the clothes we wear will be connected to the internet, from, from watches, rings, and jewelry to the running shoes we work out in, all reporting on our movements, our activities, and our lifestyles. Everything we wear, use, and come into contact with will eventually be sending back information via the internet to a third party. This gets more interesting, but uh, you know we have watches, and there's Fitbits, and all kinds of things. Those things can be really helpful right now. 
But you can, you can start to see which direction this is all going, can't you? Now listen to this. By 2023, scientists and sociologists believe that 80% of all the people on the planet will have some form of digital presence. According to a recently published report, digital life is a quote, is becoming inextricably linked with a person's physical life. Digital life, physical life. So important is this digital online life that it is widely accepted that very soon a person in the very short-term future, get this, will not be able to buy or sell if they do not have even a basic digital presence. They believe that this threshold may be reached at some point within the next few years, certainly by 2022. You start looking at this, you're going, wow. Crypto, a little bit more, we're almost done with this section. Cryptocurrencies, a.k.a. Bitcoin. You heard, how many heard of Bitcoin? Get a lot of you. Cryptocurrencies and digital currencies uh, formats are also going to replace and make obsolete all hard cash. How often have we heard about a cashless society? Uh, because of Revelation 13. Cash in your pockets is a thing of the past. These digital currencies, which are based on mechanisms called blockchains for their transactions, will likely be used by some Western governments for the first time to collect taxes by 2022. Very, very soon, he writes, the whole world really will be as one digitally. Nobody will escape from it. We are now reaching a point in human history where almost everything we do, our habits, our preferences and biases, down to our associates, families, the properties we live in, all uh, records about us anywhere and everywhere are going to be, amalg- uh, uh, I can't read that word, centralized and kept forever. Soon, uh, the means to analyze your personal data will become more widely available and it will begin to be used against you. Of that, there is no doubt. Now, remember what I showed you at the very beginning. Take down your billboard. Private industry, a Democratic senator saying this is the tip of the iceberg. We're going after any dissenting voices is essentially what he was saying. Now, this, it's going to be used against you. Revelation 13, it's going to be used against you. Mass data technology means that we can never escape from what we have written, posted, emailed, what we have bought and from where, our loans, debts, and paychecks, what we have messaged. Every single piece of data that exists out there on us can and will soon be brought to bear against us. There is nowhere to hide. Aren't you glad you came tonight? I have said before that the technology revealed in Revelation is the technology of now. It is not the technology of 2040. The tribulation isn't going to be in 20 years' time. The tribulation is going to be soon, really soon. We've reached, we're about to reach the technological tipping point, one that nobody on this earth is going to escape from. And then he says, Jesus must literally be standing at the door. So I look at this, and I think, wow. Uh, that's really well put together and well thought through. Business wants to use it because it helps them. Government wants to use it because they're going to control you. When I say government, I'm talking ultimately, ultimately this is going to get into the hands of the government of the Antichrist that he will oversee and that this, we're going to have, this globalist agenda is going to come about. Um, we are being tracked, we are being recorded, all your searches are being saved. We are identified with facial recognition software. We're tracked from location to location using cameras, a GPS on our phone, cell tower pings, and car license plates. Um, I recall while uh, I was teaching a Bible prophecy message right after 9-11, you know, back in 2001, some of you weren't saved yet, um, back in 2001 saying that everything is going to change. Governments are going to start taking more and more control. We're going to be tracked more and more in, in these different things. Uh, it's beyond that, way beyond that, everything is shaping up to the place that Revelation 13 tells us it's going to be. Uh, the mark will give government ability to hunt terrorists, pedophiles, and drug dealers. And everyone that doesn't go along with the system, which includes believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, on the one hand, go after the pedophiles. 
right? On the one hand, go after the, the drug dealers and the terrorists. On the other hand, um, get rid of anybody that doesn't go along with the narrative. Um, kill the haters. Isn't that an interesting thing? We keep hearing about haters. A hater is anyone that just disagrees with somebody else now, apparently. So let's kill the hater. So which is more hate? To say, I disagree with you? Or to say, I'm going to kill you? Well, I'm going to kill you because you're a hater. You look at that and you go, well, this doesn't make any sense. Three more questions. Number five, how much data can be stored? I'm glad you asked. One example, the NSA's data center uh, opened in uh, May of 2014. So that's now four years old. So it's old by technology, technology standards. The, but that particular facility covers a million square feet. It makes it larger than the U.S. Capitol. Um, plus, there are other databases in San Antonio and Maryland and who knows about others that are uh, not even listing. These things are huge. The data in them is enormous. Um, get this. This is where this gets really interesting. NPR estimated that the Utah Data Center, the one you see on the screen, will store five zettabytes of data. What is a zettabyte? A zettabyte equals uh, a billion terabytes. According to Forbes, you would need just 400 terabytes to hold all of the books ever written in any language. A zettabyte equals a billion terabytes. So by the NPR estimate, this one NSA data storage facility in Utah can hold two and a half million times as much data as all the books that have ever been written in any language in the history of the world combined. That's a lot. Zeal Bay. That's a lot. It's really impossible to imagine that, that much info would need to be stored. Uh, Wired Magazine estimates it can hold yottabytes. Uh, what's a yottabyte? Not to be confused with a yottabyte. <laughs> Not a yottabyte, a yottabyte. So make sure you got that in your head. Unless you're a computer geek, you probably have never heard of a, of a yottabyte. Or a yottabyte. Uh, a yottabyte is the largest measure of digital data that we have yet named, that I know of. Of course, I'm not a techno technology guy, maybe there's another one. But in order to appreciate a yottabyte, let's get a smaller measurement uh, of di digital data, exabyte. So the world's capacity to store data was about 2.6 exabytes in, two th in 1986. By 2000, it had risen to 55 exabytes. By 2007, the combined storage capacity of all the world's computers reached 295 exabytes. Uh, this might not make sense to much of you, but it's going to come together. Trust me, and this gets bizarre and kind of frightening. Uh, compared to a yottabyte, that's nearly nothing. It takes a million exabytes to equal one yottabyte. Now, one more comparison, and then we'll wrap up. The Kingston Company has been selling one terabyte thumb drives. So the thumb drive's about that big, right? One terabyte thumb drives uh, for a few years. In other words, they can fit a terabyte of data on a flash storage unit smaller than your thumb. Okay, to visualize that, let's so imagine letter-sized pages of written data, plain text data, can be stored at a rate of 256,000 pages per megabyte. That means a megabyte of text fills a stack of paper 1,024 inches tall. I think that's like 85 feet tall or something like that. That is a tall stack of paper. Okay, but a terabyte is a million times larger than a megabyte. Okay, get this. That means you can store on one Kingston thumb drive, this big, the equivalent of a stack of paper more than 16,000 miles high. How high is that? The International Space Station orbits about 240 miles above the Earth. Our stack of paper would be 67 times higher than the International Space Station, all stored on one thumb drive. Needless to say, your stuff is being collected. And with all this information, um, 
on every person, the Antichrist will seem omniscient. He's going to seem all-knowing. But it's not just digital. It's going to give him the ability to appear like God to people. He won't be, but he's going to have all this access within seconds to anybody in the world. Isn't that fascinating? Last two questions. Why so much data storage? If the NSA captured and stored every bit of internet traffic this year, it would be less than one thousandth of a single yottabyte. So, what do they intend to keep in, these, in data storage? Well, uh, Ira Hunt, former CIA chief technology officer, said, we fundamentally try to collect everything and hang on to it forever. I watched a show, I think I've shared this with you before, um, it was some people trying to live off the grid. Uh, they don't want to be on the grid. They're preppers off the grid. You know, if you're a prepper, you're a prepper. Um, but they were off the grid. But they had a TV show. So it, it confused me. You have cameras there going to your place where nobody knows where you live. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you, people think they are hiding, but there, there is dust now that has the ability to uh that's been created it, it's it's digital stuff that that can microscopic size things that can that can track you and they're saying this dust particles in the near future will be able to go underneath doors and go into houses just start looking at this you're going this is this is the age we live in I, i'm not making these things up these things are real you start looking you're going Revelation 13, no one will be able to buy or sell unless they receive the mark of the beast. You go, man, but don't worry. Jesus is coming. I can see some of the looks on your faces. Like, <laughs> I told Pastor Craig last week, I said, I don't know if I should do this message. I'm going to scare people. Number seven, last question. Will people tolerate such intrusion into their lives? They already do. They already do. Every terror attack, every school shooting, every mass casualty event triggers a louder public outcry for peace and safety. Every speech that someone ter determines is hate speech brings another loud outcry. Get rid of them, right? So we are well down this path. Uh, this world has been prepared for such a time as this. Uh, I, uh, soon after the rapture, um, there's going to be very little opposition to this type of thing that we're looking at. Because people are already thinking, we need to kill the president. We need to kill people. We need to remove them from having a public voice if they are not going along with the system. You and I are hearing that already. I showed you news articles that are as of this past week. Uh, these things are out there. So as soon as, um, as soon as the rapture takes place, there's not going to be so much opposition. There's still going to be people that are saying, man, this is a problem, right? Um, but think of it like this. The Bible is very clear in 2 Thessalonians that uh, the Antichrist won't be revealed until the restrainer is taken away. And I believe that the Lord is working through believers. It's the Holy Spirit that is restraining back all this evil. How else can you explain that these things haven't all been done already. And we watch everything else is taking place. And you start to go, wow. So I put all of these things together. This is what I know. Uh, when you see these things begin to take place, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Amen? Amen. 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 Did you guys get scared? No? I'm, I'm sure some of you did. Because I see looks on your face like, now what am I going to do? Listen, it's Jesus, right? I can't conclude this message without this. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus loves you. Everything is unfolding exactly as the Bible says it will. So because of that, uh, everything is falling into place. We can know, you watch the alignment of nations, you watch what we've seen tonight, technology. We watch what's going on with Israel. We watch all these things. Everything happens to be happening exactly as the Bible said it would, down to the country's name and the people named. It's just, what is it, a coincidence? No, God told us beforehand so that we would know. Amos the prophet wrote that God does nothing unless he tells it through his prophets first. We have the word of God 
to direct us so that we can know. All this means Jesus is coming. And, and, and we can look up because our redemption draws. Our hope, listen, our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.